Good morning, Genesis. If you are in the open space, go ahead and begin to work your way in. And if you are currently in the sanctuary, uh, why don't you guys go ahead and already stand up with me? My name is Michael, and I am thankful that you guys are here. I serve as one of the pastors, and if you're joining us online this morning, thanks for taking about an hour of your time uh, on a Sunday to be with us. Uh, today is a good day. We are finishing our series that we have been in for the past six weeks called Donkeys, Elephants, and the Lamb. And really our one heart and hope uh, throughout this entire series has just been, God, align our hearts with what your heart is today. And that is really no different uh, of what our hope is for today. It's kind of the image that I have is if we had our hands out uh, in a posture of ready to receive, that God actually has something He wants to give you today. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing some songs. But as I'm praying, uh, if you would, you can, if you're comfortable, you can just put your hands out and just say, God, whatever you have for me today, that's exactly what I want to receive from you. I don't want to come into this space, into this moment with my hands closed, or my hands in my pockets. God, if you really do have something for me, I want to receive whatever that might be. So God, we give thanks that uh, you know us. You know us, you love us, you care about us, and you want to give to us today what we need most. And so God, with our hands open wide, we want to receive from you today what that is. God, if there are some folks that just need some help, some hope, some encouragement, God, if there are some, some men and women that just need answers to questions that they have been asking, God, if there's some that just need challenge or conviction, reminders or inspiration, God, I pray with our hands open wide, we'd receive whatever it is that is from you for us in this moment, that we would leave this moment a little bit different than when we came in. And God, what I'm praying is that we would leave this space being able to say we heard from God, we got to see God, and because of that, we're leaving here loving God more than when we first came in. So God, we lift our voices to you. We give you our minds and our hearts to receive what you have uh, for us today through your preached word. So God, take these moments and bless them, that this is truly a sacred time that we have together and we're thankful for it. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, we got a new song. We're going to play the chorus, teach you the words a little bit. It goes like this. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. There's nothing. the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough and you came along and put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing better. Show you 
God of mercy is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find. Yeah. No.
Lord, we thank you this morning that we get to sing your name together. I believe, Lord, that there's power here. In Ephesians, it says that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and principalities in the spiritual realm. And Lord, when I hear all my brothers and sisters singing this with me, all hail King Jesus, I know that this is how we fight. This is how we tap into the power of the Spirit living within us. It's through worship. It's through remembering. It's through declaring that you are King. That you are worthy of the surrender of our lives. You are worthy of our obedience. You are worthy, Lord, of our love. Lord, thank you for the reminder today to me, to my heart, that us singing together, it's not just something we do because it's fun, but we do this because there's power here. Something happens when we sing, something happens when we worship together. Lord, and I believe that part of that is this fight that we get to call off the darkness when we call in your presence. Lord, will we understand that power a little more fully today? Would we understand the power of your presence more fully today? Thank you for being with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for never leaving. Lord, all power, all glory, all fame belongs to you. Be honored in our prayer, in the reading of your word, in our song this morning. Lord, we ask all of this humbly and expectantly. We love you. It's in the beautiful name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Uh, well, good morning. Thank you for being with us. My name is Kyle. I serve as one of the pastors, and uh, I am excited uh, to be with you this morning, but I'll also be honest with you. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I've ever had so much trouble writing a sermon uh, as much as I've had with this one. Because when you're tasked with preaching on politics, it just kind of feels like a lose-lose battle. Because I've just felt so much pressure this week. And maybe the pressure is real, maybe it's not, but what I've felt is when it comes to something like politics, uh, everyone who's walked through the door, you already have your opinions. You, most of you, you think what you think, you know what you know, and so you're coming in here and you're more listening of what can I agree with and what can I disagree with? And you might not implicitly, I'm sorry, you might not explicitly want me to uh, endorse some candidate, but implicitly, the pressure I feel is that you want me to say some things about the Bible which will lead to the conclusion that you should vote this way or that way. And so I felt this pressure of, man, how are people going to interact with this? And, and that pressure kind of comes with the territory, so I'm okay with that. Uh, it's compounded with the pressure I'm sure you've heard the same ads that I've heard and seen the same commercials, that this is election is the most important election, right? This is for the soul of our country. And if that's true, I got, like, I don't want to mess this up. Like, if this is truly one of the biggest moments in our country's history, I don't want to be the guy to mess it up. And so I've struggled this week to write, and I've had to rewrite, and I've had to edit, and I've had to rewrite. As I sought to answer this question, how do we live in the marriage of faith and politics? How do you live with faith and with politics? How would you answer that? And for some of you, you can answer it like that. Like you know. There's no hitch in your step. Uh, you can't wait for Tuesday to come because you got your candidate and you're ready to ride. 
But for me, if I'm just being honest, I've struggled to have a robust answer. I've really struggled to get like this comprehensive view. And I somewhat saw this sermon coming like back in March. And so I started reading and studying. And I was trying to count up how much I've read on faith and politics. And I think I'm near like 3,500 pages. And here's my answer. I don't know. I guess a lot of waste of time. It's complicated. It's hard. How do we live in the marriage of faith and politics? And I don't want to be the guy to mess it up for you. But then I had this realization. The church has been messing this question up since its beginning. Like, we just want to take a little detour into church history. We have always messed this question up. Let's just think about it. Jesus Christ dies in 33 A.D., rises from the grave, right, saves us, ascends into heaven 50 days later, Holy Spirit comes down, and the church is institutionalized. And for the early church, life is hard, but politically speaking, it's not complicated. Because you're living in an empire that wants you dead. You have no political power, no political persuasion. The only thing politically you have is persecution. And so this constant thread throughout the New Testament is, how do you live unto Christ? Well, the empire wants to kill you. It's hard. It's not complicated. Look to Christ. That's your only hope. And this uh, same posture goes into the early church. When you think of kind of the bulwarks of the early church and some of the guys who shaped our doctrines and our theologies, they're all writing about the same thing. How to live faithfully unto Christ in an empire that wants you dead. When you have no power, no influence, no social capital. And so all these guys are killed for it. Ignatius, Polycarp, Tertullian. Justin Martyr, they're all killed to try to figure out how do you live between the marriage of faith and politics. Something crazy happens, though, in the 4th century. Emperor, the, uh, the Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity. And all of a sudden, everything flips. Life ain't hard anymore. Faith is legal. I got some power. I got some influence. I got a little political sway. But politically speaking, life gets very complicated. It takes all of a second for faith and politics to become this really ugly marriage of corruption and adultery, infidelity, as they try to live in the tension. And so it doesn't surprise us that one of the first early church writings that come out of this period is by a guy named Augustine. Augustine is probably the most influential church father outside of New Testament authors. And he writes a book called The City of God. And The City of God is now about living in the city of God while the earthly city, you have some power. You have some influence. He sees the corruption. He sees the adulterous marriage of faith and politics. He says, get to the city of God. This is where you belong. Don't live here. But we don't really figure that out. We keep messing it up. You get the rise in the, of the Holy Roman Empire and the power of the Pope who has complete authority over both government and church. And that much power leads to so much corruption, so much infighting, that the uh, Holy Roman Empire splits with the Great Schism. Then you have East, you have West. In that time, you have Charlemagne, who has state-sanctioned Christianity. Like, bend the knee or die. In that time, you have the Crusades. Right? Religious, political wars in the Middle East this marriage of faith and politics, we keep messing it up. And so finally, in the 16th century, a guy named Martin Luther comes along and says, I've had it. No more. I'm sick of the corruption. So you get the Protestant Reformation. All right? And Luther says, go back to the Bible. Go back to Augustine. Go back to the city of God. Because in his view, if the Protestant leaders have control, well, then it will be pure. Well, it takes all two seconds for the Protestants to live in a really messy marriage of faith and politics. And you get into European country and European history. And depending who's in charge of what country, whether it be Catholic or Protestant or a certain stream of Protestantism, if you don't believe the right things, the government will banish you, expel you, kill you. 
because we can't figure out faith in politics. And so a group of people look to the new world, they set sail. Who are they? Christian separatists. The pilgrims. Because they were sick of the corruption, they were sick of this marriage. They said, we got to get away from this. Let's get back where we can just worship Christ and get back to Augustine, city of God. That's where we want to live. So they come to New England. What happens next? Colonists come over. Puritans come over. You get the rise of like Methodists and Baptists and Anabaptists. And once again, politics and faith get so messy, so corrupt. Gets the American Revolution, which is a profoundly religious war. You get the Constitution, which they're trying for separation of church and state. Never really happens. Great in principle, not in practice. And it's been one constant messed up marriage between faith and politics. And so here we sit, November 2020, with this momentous moment, with this feeling of, we don't want to mess it up. We've been messing it up for 2,000 years. So how do we live in the marriage between faith and politics? I think one of the main things I've learned in the course of the past few months, reading, studying, having conversations, is this. It's okay to feel a little confused. We should feel a little homeless. It's okay not to have all the answers. And it's okay to admit that there's this kind of tension pulling me right now. It's okay to feel a tension between faith and politics. And if you're not feeling the tension between the two, well, I don't think you're reading the history. And I would humbly just submit to you, you might be starting with the party platform and not starting with the Bible. If you're not feeling a pull right now and a little turn in your gut about how politics and faith blend, it might be because you're holding a little too closely to a donkey or to an elephant. And you're not searching for what it means to live like the lamb. Because see, we've been in this series, Donkeys, Elephants, and Lambs. And for the last five weeks, all we've been doing is trying to think about how do you have a biblical worldview when confronted with political issues? And so it makes sense this morning that we would end on the topic of politics. Because in 2,000 years, if history teaches us anything, it's that donkeys and elephants will never figure it out. They will always let us down every time. And we have two millennia to prove it. So how do we live in the marriage of the two? Well, it really all leads to one question I want us to consider first, namely this. Why do we keep putting so much faith in donkeys and elephants? If that's our history, why do we put so much faith and hope and allegiance to a donkey and an elephant? Why is our uh, preference of donkey or elephant so strong, so tight, that it can divide families? It can cost you friendships. It can can cause rifts in the church. Why is your allegiance to a donkey or to an elephant so strong that you can't even sit, to, sit with someone else who disagrees, who has a different conclusion than you? How can it be that the church of Christ, which is tasked with preaching the gospel, how can the question that's consumed us for the last three, four months been to Trump or not to Trump? To Biden or not to Biden? How do we keep putting so much faith and donkeys, and elephants, and bow down to them like they're idols when we have 2,000 years of history that proves they can't do that. They can't deliver. Why does Tuesday feel like it's going to be one of the heaviest days in modern history? Why is our faith and hope in donkeys and elephants? If you have your Bibles, go to Psalm 2. And as you flip there, just uh, so I can tell you where the plane's flying today. 
I have no intention to sway you to vote one way or the other. Every time I get the privilege to open up the word, my goal is singular. I want you to love Jesus more, and I want me to love Jesus more. And so I want us camped out in Psalm 2, because Psalm 2 is one of the best texts I know of that juxtaposes donkeys and elephants with the lamb. Because Psalm 2, it's a messianic psalm, which means there's an immediate context for David, but it's more so about Jesus. It's more so about the lamb. So let's read God's word this morning and see what he would say about our faith and hope in donkeys and elephants and how to live in the marriage. Starting in verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. In short, David looks at this facade of power and authority that the donkey's elephants has, and he says, there's nothing there. The Lord mocks them. The Lord laughs at them. It's why Psalm 2 becomes one of the most alluded to psalms in the New Testament, because Psalm 2 is ultimately about the kingdom of God, which Jesus picks up in the Gospels, and he shapes his ministry around it. Because biblically speaking, there's two kingdoms. There's kingdom of God and kingdom of darkness. Or as Augustine wrote, city of God in the earthly city. In these two kingdoms, God and darkness, they're necessarily opposed to one another. Look what David writes. He says, the nations are raging. They make war against God's way. They make war against God's ethic. They make war against God's rule. It says the rulers set themselves up. It's not about policy. This is about power. The abuse of it. The abuse of authority. It's me-centeredness. They connive against the Lord. They're trying to usurp his authority. The kingdom of darkness is ruled by men and women in their pursuit of some illusion to power. And David writes this. He sees this in front of him. I mean, he's clearly leading Israel, and it's a different form of government. But he sees the nations rage against God. He sees the Philistines rage. He sees the Amorites rage. He sees the Edomites rage. He knows Assyria will rage. He knows Babylon will rage. He knows the Greco-Roman world will rage against the Lord's anointed. Right? This is the collision of the two kingdoms. But hear this. The same kingdom battle that is present in Psalm 2 is still present today. The kingdom of God in the kingdom of darkness, it's still happening right now. And this is where it gets complex. Because I told you, Jesus alludes to this psalm more than any other one because he ushers in the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God and darkness, they're opposed to one another, but they still exist in the same room. Because when Jesus conquers death, the kingdom of God starts to invade. And as it invades, it expands, and it's starting to conquer all. So it's already here, but not yet in totality. This is the tension that we feel. Like as a Christian, you should feel a little uncomfortable with our American political system. And I'm going to say this as a guy who loves America. I love the USA. After this sermon, I will get in my car, drive home, and blare Toby Keith, God bless the USA. I'm going to eat a burger just because I can. I'll watch grown men hit each other on a football field. And on Tuesday morning, dang it, I'm going to wake up and vote because I love America. But America rages too. The American political system is raging against God's kingdom. That's the tension you feel. What does Philippians 3 say? Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong there. We bend the knee to Christ. Our ultimate submission is to the king of glory in heaven. That's our homeland. But then we get down here and we say, well, how do I live here? Because if I belong here, but God has me here, 
well, how do I live? How do I live with this marriage of faith and politics? Because we're here. I believe God wants us to seek the welfare of our city. I think government is God instituted. I think it's common grace, right? which means he's using government to extend good to restrain evil. But how do we interact in a government when our citizenship is ultimately in heaven? And if we're going to talk about politics, let's just talk about it. It's okay to just call a spade a spade here. Here's the toughness about Christians in our specific context. It is such a bipartisan government. And so as a Christian, you, you, you look at this and you think, how do I live here? I'm going to paint with a really broad stroke here. Uh, so I know it's generalized, I know it's more intricate and nuanced, but uh, for the sake of 30 minutes, just uh, cut me some slack. There's primarily two political ideologies in America. There's conservative and there's progressive, right? And so we're forced to choose between a backward politic or a forward politic. Because if you're a Christian conservative, you look and you want to go backwards. Because you think, okay, if I go back, it'd be great to go back to a time when we weren't killing our babies. It'd be great to go back to a time when we had a God-defined definition of marriage. It'd be great to go back to a time when we had a God-defined sexuality and gender. And so I want to go back to the good old days. But what's the critique? Well, good for who? Good for some. But you also have discrimination back there. You have Jim Crow back there. You have gender inequality back there. So it might be the good old days for the good old boys. Not good for all. And so the pushback is, okay, if I'm not going back, I've got to go forward then. Right? We've got to be progressive. Because what's the tagline? Get on the right side of history. Right? That's, that's forward politics. And so as a Christian progressive, you would say uh, unilateral equality for all, no matter what. It's heal all social wounds and woes. It's engaged in all these different ways that we make sure everyone feels like they have whatever they need as they define it. What's the critique? It's such an elevation of self-determining, self-defining, self-autonomous people that you're so far outside a biblical definition of morality and a biblical definition of imago Dei. And so it's tug of war now. Do I got to go backwards because some things are better back here? Or do I go forwards because some things are better forward and it's back and it's forth? And you, how do I live in this? Here's a question though. What if both backwards politics and forward politics, what if they're both manifestations of a raging king? What if they're both more about us and less about the lamb. Here's why I ask. The kingdom of God is not backwards, it's not forwards. The kingdom of God is down. The call of the Christian is bring the kingdom down. That citizenship you have in heaven, bring that down. What does Jesus teach us to pray? On earth as it is in heaven. So, elephants can go backwards, donkeys can go forwards, but kingdom down has a much different ruler. It's a ruler the psalmist writes about in verse 6. He says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill, and I will tell you of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As for me, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. In other words, since there's a different kingdom, we have a very different king. And immediately this is about David and God's promise to David, but this is Jesus' language. King of Zion, holy hill, endless authority. This is about the Lamb. And so the psalmist is getting to, he says, the kingdom of God is marked by a different king. And the one who sits on this throne, it's Christ. 
It's the Lord's anointed. It's the lamb. It's his rule. It's his reign. Jesus is being interviewed by a political person being asked political questions. And that's significant. And Pilate asks, where's your kingdom? You backwards, you forwards. John 18, my kingdom is not of this earth. I'm kingdom down. If his kingdom is not of this world, why do we expect his kingdom to make sense in this world? The lamb looks very different, which means politically we ought to look very different because we're trying to bring God's kingdom down. Our political positions, our political postures, our political platforms, our political punditry, it needs to have the aroma of Jesus. The way we engage, it needs to smell of Christ and of the Lamb. Because that's the kingdom we belong to, and that's the kingdom we're called to bring down, because that's the king we bow down to. Question. Question you think about where you line up politically and maybe you've already voted maybe you're gearing up to vote on Tuesday is your baseline question how can I best interact in a way that brings the kingdom down how can I best interact in a way that's about the lamb ruling his king how do I best represent my citizenship which is in heaven or have you put so much faith and so much hope in donkeys and elephants? And so you'll just settle. We are kingdom down people. We're not allowed to settle. If you think about uh, the way you interact and think, hear this, but hear it in love, but definitely hear it. If your political posture is marked by arrogance, kind of a self-righteous, I know everything and I am God's gift to this planet because I have all the answers to all the things and, and you're an idiot if you don't think like me and you're a moron if you don't vote like me and I don't have a category for how you could think differently than me. Right, if that's your political disposition, you're not bringing heaven down, you're bringing hell up. If you're going to be on the conservative side of things. It's great. And as a Christian conservative, you're going to constantly fight for and against abortion. It's a worthy fight. But if that fervor doesn't lead you to also fight against racism, doesn't lead you to also fight for the oppressed and for the immigrant doesn't lead you to also fight for oppressed communities and look for the restoration. You're pulling something over, but it ain't heaven. If you want to be on the progressive side of things and you, and you have this, you know, anger about the unbiblicalness and the immorality of the president. And it's constantly calling him out in the people who align with him. Okay. But if that same definition of immorality and unbiblicalness doesn't lead you to speak up and speak out against abortion or marriage or sexuality or gender... You're pulling something over, but it ain't heaven. We are kingdom down people. And Jesus' kingdom doesn't fit with what we have down here. He's not going to go backwards all the times. He's not going to go forwards all the times. So we can stop bouncing him around like a political volleyball all in some pseudo pursuit of his glory. No, our kingdom, our king is heaven down. That's who we interact with. There's no reason for faith and hope 
and elephants and donkeys. Because it doesn't fit with the kingdom of God. It doesn't fit with the lamb. question, though, is this. What are the handlebars to this? Because that's true. It's right. But we still live backwards forwards. We still have to make a vote on Tuesday. We still have to engage in politics. And I'm grateful for a friend this week who reminded me that politics is so much more than just one vote. And as Jonathan Lehman says, uh, anytime you try to add order to chaos, you're engaging in politics. So we should be engaging in politics all the time. How do we engage in politics, kingdom down, right, lamb first, when we're kind of forced to go backwards, forwards? Right, how do we vote? Do we vote? Let's finish off the psalm and see what we can learn from God's word, starting in verse 10. It says, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in that way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So it says, not my role nor calling to tell you who to vote for. In fact, there's a long line of faithful, God-fearing, Jesus-loving people who've chosen not to vote uh, for religious reasons. If that's you, I have no qualms. But if you feel like it's our obligation to interact, to seek the welfare of the city, to function in God-ordained government, how do we do it? I think there's two things that we can learn from Psalm 2. The first is this. Be lamb-focused in all things. In everything that we do, we are lamb-focused first. I love the language here. Serve the Lord and kiss the Son. That is in all things as we try to bring heaven down, we are first and foremost always submitting to the Lamb. We are saying, Christ, I'm going to be focused on you. And if you care about it, I care about it. And what that means to be Lamb-focused is we're focused on the things the Lamb was focused on. So when I read the New Testament, when I read the Gospels, I don't see Jesus getting super worked up at 30,000 foot politics. I don't see him super worked up about Herod or Caesar who's in charge. I see the lamb focused a ton on holiness. I see the lamb focused a ton on lost people being reconciled to God. I see the lamb focused a ton on loving your neighbor well. I see the lamb focused a ton on restoring the Imago Dei in all image bearers. And I see the lamb most worked up on assault against God's glory and against sin. And if that's what the lamb is focused on, that's what we're focused on. And you might say, that's not political. That doesn't help. I'd push back and say that's very political. Not political in the way you want it to be. But that's the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God coming down. And when it comes down, it's necessarily going to rub against both donkeys and elephants at different times. That's a lamb focus. Right? We're never going to be able to fit. We're going to chafe on both ends. There's times when Jesus is radically conservative. Think of his sexual ethic. There are times when Jesus seems radically progressive. Give away everything to the poor. Jesus doesn't fit. Kingdom down is always going to put you at odds with donkeys and elephants at different times. And so what that means, if you have a lamb focus, you can stop holding so tightly to whatever elephant or donkey you prefer. You don't have to agree with everything all the time. One thing I've noticed about myself and about a lot of people in the last few months is we all just have this big old fat political butt. And so we'll be in political conversations and if someone pushes back on you, gets something you disagree with, uh, instead of 
finding the lamb focused in that statement. You just pivot. Yeah, but. Lamb focused, you don't need the but. The president said something dumb. Yeah, but. It's hard to get on board with a party that supports abortion on demand. But yeah, but. We should care a lot about environment, earth, stewarding well what God's given us. Yeah, but. Police brutality is wrong. Yeah, but. Looting and rioting is wrong. Yeah, but. What if we just drop the but? If it breaks the lamb's heart, it breaks our heart. If Christ was against it, we're against it. If Jesus promoted it, we promote it. That's what it means to be lamb-focused. We are always going to chafe. And it's just be okay with that. It's somewhat harsh and somewhat aggressive, but I appreciate uh, what the evangelical strategist for the Obama campaign wrote. He said, if for every issue, all the time, you always find yourself in the same party, one of two things is happening. One, you're being intellectually dishonest, or two, you're being biblically lazy. Lamb, focus, kingdom, down, will always chafe. You're never going to fit. And so as lamb-focused people, we engage with culture, we engage in society, and if Jesus cared about it, we care about it. If it helps us love our neighbor, we're going to be about that. If it supports a biblical ethic and a biblical moral, we're going to be about that. As Christians, we should be the hardest people to pin down. Because Jesus didn't fit. This means to have a lamb focus. Here's the second thing we learned from Psalm 2. I'm taking it straight from verse 12. It says, uh, take refuge in the lamb. So the election's heavy. Right? Real politicians make real policies that affect real people. And so depending on your experience, your perspective, what policies you think are best to accomplish, whatever tasks you're most passionate about, you're going to vote differently. Uh, and that just, it is what it is. But one thing we can all have in common is we can all take refuge in the Lamb. Because on Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever we figure out who won the election, some will be very happy and some will feel like the world's burning down around you. The Lamb still reigns. We can still take comfort in who God is for us in Jesus Christ. Because the kingdom we belong to and the king we serve, he was not elected in. He reigns because of an execution. The church will stand forever. Your blood-bought citizenship is secure. And so I know it feels heavy. I know it's going to be stressful for some. But give God's sovereignty some handlebars. The good shepherd still tends his flock. We can take refuge in Christ. Donald Trump will be a footnote in a history book. Joe Biden will be a footnote in a history book. The lamb will reign forever. We can hold on to that. Our future is incredibly bright. It's the refuge Psalm 2 is helping us get to. How do we engage? We have a lamb focus. If Jesus was focused on it, we are focused on it. And we take refuge in who God is. 2,000 years of political faith, marriage dysfunction, the donkeys and elephants have yet to figure it out. I'm incredibly pessimistic that this go around we will. It's okay to feel like you don't belong. It's okay to feel a little politically homeless. It's okay to feel this tug of war that's kingdom down. 
And if Jesus didn't fit, maybe we shouldn't either. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your kingdom. We thank you that your kingdom's coming, that it was initiated in the work and the ministry of Christ. And we thank you that through your, through your local church, the kingdom is still in breaking. Please help us see it more fully. Lord, just pray for our church and pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. It's just a hard, heavy time. But I pray uh, our church, I pray the American church would be a witness of what it means to have a lamb focus. I pray that we would be the hardest people to pin down because there's just this coolness Not an apathy, not an indifference, but a calmness. Because we're taking refuge in you. Please help us, Christ. Heal wounds that have been made in the past few months. Redeem relationships, redeem conversations. Redeem us and help us be so focused on kingdom down. Christ, help us resemble you in all ways. From the way we engage our families, the way we engage our friends, the way we engage our coworkers, and the way we engage our politic. Let us have the aroma of you. We pray in your name, Christ. Amen. Will you please stand and worship with us?
the past uh, six Sundays that we've been doing this series, Donkeys, Elephants, and the Lamb, uh, we finish each worship gathering by singing, Be Thou My Vision. And the reason that we are singing that song is because that's our one heart, that's our one hope, and that is our heart. Uh, as we have navigated some challenging, difficult topics over these past six weeks as we've been praying and singing and asking God, at the end of the day, we just want you and who you are and what you have done for us to be our vision, that who we see in you would shape how we see ourselves, how we see the people around us, how we see the world around us, and that would drive how we love and serve and engage the world around us. If government reminds me of anything, it reminds me that I'm a sinner. Uh, and it reminds me that there's a lot of evil uh, in me and a lot of evil in the world. And there is not one political system or government, certainly no donkey or elephant, that could ever heal the sin within my own heart. I love the simplicity of the title of this series, Donkeys and Elephants. They can't do anything to help my soul get right with God. Only the lamb can. Only the lamb can heal my sin, forgive my sin, and make me right with God. And so if you've been navigating this entire series with us or you're just joining us today in this series for the first time, we'd want you to know that it is the Lamb and the Lamb alone that makes you and I right with God both now and forever. So if you have never looked to the Lamb, to Jesus, to make you right with God, it's His death, it's His resurrection, it's His life that brings forgiveness and healing and peace now and forevermore. So Jesus, we give thanks that it is you and you alone, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, that can heal our soul, that can bring peace between us and God, both now and forever. Jesus, we give thanks for your life that was perfect without sin. We give thanks for your sacrificial death on the cross. But we give thanks that the story did not end in a tomb or did not end on a cross, but new life is found in an empty tomb. So Jesus, we give thanks that you have not only conquered sin, but conquered death. And for any one of us who looks to you and you alone will find life and life eternal. Forgive us for the many times we've looked to donkeys and elephants and other political systems to figure things out. Jesus, we look to you and you alone. And God, we have sung it now for six weeks. We have prayed this for six weeks, that you would be our vision. So God, when we go from here and we wake up tomorrow and Monday and we do what we'll do on Tuesday and we wake up on Wednesday and Thursday, we pray that you and you alone, Father God, would be our vision. And what we see in you would shape how we live and love in the world that you have placed us in. So Jesus, we give thanks for your goodness and your grace and your kindness to us. May we extend that to everyone that we will see and interact and, and engage with this coming week. We pray that, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thanks again for being with us. Thanks for joining us online this morning. Uh, a series like this and a message like this might leave you with maybe some questions, some things that you want to talk a little bit further about, or maybe some things that you even want to pray about. If you've made maybe a decision to say, hey, I'm done looking to the political systems to fix things, I'm looking to Christ, we'd love to have that conversation with you. So if you're watching online, there's a link online that you can just click on our website called My Next Step. We'd love to take that step with you. And if you're here in the space, this space or the open space, Love for you to stop by our living room, because in our living room, there's some great folks from our leadership team that are there to love you, encourage you, answer any questions that you might have, or even pray with you if you want to take a next step in your walk with God. Have a great rest of this day. God bless. Peace out.